Ontario has its first socialist government, and the world has its first elected politician who is totally deaf. But how effective can disabled advocates be once they are inside the system? Hello and welcome to our brand new season of DNet, the Disability Network. I'm Joe Coughlin. And I'm Susan Pettit. First, here's a roundup of disability stories in this week's news. On September the 6th, the New Democratic Party won a big majority in the Ontario election. Activist Gary Milkowski also won big in the NDP sweep, becoming the world's first totally deaf parliamentarian. The 90s are clearly shaping a new political landscape. We'll take an in-depth look at the role disabled politicians are playing in this landscape later on this program. There's been another breakthrough in the search for a cure for cystic fibrosis, gene therapy. Experiments on people are still years away, but scientists at Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children can now replace the gene that causes cystic fibrosis. Dr. Johanna Romans talked to DNET about how this breakthrough could eventually help cystic fibrosis patients. To take an, a correct gene, somehow get it into the affected cells of CF patients, and hopefully then their defect would be cured. If you can cure that defect, because we know now that CF is a single gene defect, hopefully all the secondary effects or the symptoms that you see in CF patients should then disappear. We'll look at that story in greater detail next week. A 22-year-old diabetic trucker has won a court decision to regain his chauffeur's license. Paul Barr reports from Halifax. Clint Hines lost his license to drive last summer when he was told he had diabetes. That's because the Department of Motor Vehicles has a policy that says diabetics on insulin can't operate heavy equipment in Nova Scotia. Well, Hines took the government to court last week saying it was a violation of his rights. The judge has agreed and the policy has been struck down. The decision in this case is an important one for the Canadian Diabetes Association. And I think it'll, it'll prove that uh, these people are normal. I mean, you could have people with uh, a bad heart condition that would be more of a risk than somebody on insulin. Groups representing the disabled in Manitoba have filed 12 complaints with the Human Rights Commission. They say too many buildings are still inaccessible, including the provincial legislature. They also said the complaints were just the tip of the iceberg and want the issue included in the Human Rights Code. There's going to be more help for mentally ill people in Saskatchewan. The Minister of Health, George McLeod, has announced he's pumping another million dollars into tackling the problem. Aletha Foster reports from Regina. We recognize that more still needs to be done. But every journey begins with one step, and today we'll take that first step. McLeod setting up an advisory council to government. There's also going to be more help for the chronically mentally ill a youth suicide prevention program, and finally, rural and northern Saskatchewan will get more help as well, including more counselling. The minister's announcement was greeted with cautious optimism by the Mental Health Association in Saskatchewan. It means that there's some recognition on the part of the government that what the Murray Commission ha report uh, has uh, said is in fact right, that we've fallen behind in mental health services and we're really playing catch-up now in relation to other provinces. The million dollar initiative will come out of the existing health budget. And that means something has to be cut. However, McLeod says he doesn't know exactly what health area the money will come from. Alethea Foster, CBC News, Regina. Health and Welfare Minister Perrin Beattie is now willing to negotiate with thalidomide victims. In a letter released by the War Amputations of Canada, Beattie set the stage for further meetings. War Amps is seeking increased compensation for thalidomide claimants. Up to now, the federal government has offered a fixed amount of compensation for each claimant. War Amps has rejected this offer as inadequate. Researchers in Quebec have announced promising results in the treatment of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. The treatment involves the transplant of cells known as myoblasts. When researchers injected the myoblasts into muscle tissue, they found it produced a vital protein. The protein known as dystrophin is absent in Duchenne's patients who experience a progressive weakening of muscle tissue. And that's this week's roundup of disability news. September 6, 1990 was a historic day for Ontario. The NDP party was swept into office with a massive majority. David Peterson's Liberals were out. 
Bob Ray's NDP was in. It is the province's first NDP government. Another first was the election of NDP candidate Gary Malkowski. Malkowski is profoundly deaf. This had never happened before in North America, let alone in Canada. I can't wait to see Gary's presence on the floor of the legislature and to see suddenly the bureaucracy of government realizing that for generations there have been deaf people who have not been able to communicate with government. Another disabled rights activist running in that election was Beryl Potter. Unfortunately for her, she was running as a liberal and went down to defeat with her leader, David Peterson. The growing presence of people with disabilities on the political scene is a far cry from the days when U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt hid the fact that he could stand by holding onto a podium, but he could not walk. Even the press conspired to help Roosevelt hide his disability. Unlike Roosevelt, MP Stephen Langdon, one of the NDP leadership candidates, is up front about his disability. He chose to talk about it in the House of Commons after a member made fun of his speech tremor. MPs were deeply moved by what he said. You could hear a pin drop. The place was so quiet. Another NDP politician, Percy Wickman, attracted national attention not just because he defeated Alberta Premier Don Getty, but because he uses a wheelchair. But the election of the totally deaf Malkowski is the most astonishing victory to date for aspiring politicians with disabilities. Mr. Malkowski, congratulations on your victory. Thank you very much. You were an activist for a disabled group. What made you decide to run for the legislature? First of all, from my own experience being involved in the deaf education movement and being involved in the Ontario Association for the Deaf, I was a very active member and our goal was to improve the quality of education for deaf people in this province. And I certainly wasn't very happy with the deaf education system in Ontario. The big problem being inadequate numbers of deaf teachers, administrators and denying our right to use ASL as a language of instruction, as an option in classrooms. So I became very active and had worked in that community for a good four years, working very closely with Richard Johnston, who was the NDP educa education critic. And he uh, was very sensitive to the needs of the deaf community, very encouraging, and I worked very closely with him. So my own experience within the deaf education movement and my own frustration in dealing with a government that was insensitive I felt that um, obviously I wasn't getting represented within the government system. There were all these promises about reasonable accommodation that weren't realities. So one day after uh, talking to Richard Johnston, he said that I should give it a shot and run for MPP. And I didn't feel that, that I was appropriate for that at the time, but he really was very encouraging and talked about my own personal skills and the contribution that I could make, not only for disabled people, the uh, deaf individuals, but for all people in Ontario. And it became a reality, and here I am as an M MPP. And I feel that um, I am the first deaf sign language user who has become a MPP in not only Canada, but across the world. Percy Wickman, who was an Edmonton City Alderman before winning a seat in the Alberta Legislature, no, it says it is happened. only within well, the last 10 years, years that disabled persons have had a chance at winning elections. I ran for City Council four times before I, before I was successful. Once I was successful, I never had a problem being re-elected. But when I ran in the early 70s, uh, uh, I wasn't taken as a serious candidate. In fact, in 1977, on my fourth attempt, and when I did win, uh, and, and it appeared at that time that I was going to be a contender. There was a whisper campaign that started basically on, along the lines of why elect somebody like uh, Percy Wickman who's in a wheelchair when there's all kinds of healthy people, uh, people around. And I had some di difficulty even in 77 getting elected. I did squeak in. But once I was in and I was able to prove myself, prove to the people that I that I served, that, that I could serve them just as well as the next person. Uh, when the next election came, came around in 1983, years later, uh, I, um, I, led this, I led the city on a citywide basis as far as the number of votes are concerned. In other words, I, I, I was the top vote getter throughout the city in that particular election. So once a disabled person is given the opportunity, the same opportunity as anyone else, and if they're hardworking, if they can uh, 
uh, if, if they can, in fact, uh, prove themselves, then uh, they're going to come out a winner. And finally, we asked Stephen Langdon if he agreed that disability activists like Milkowski, Wickman, Potter, and himself risk losing their influence once they are subject to government so. or caucus discipline. No, he said. I mean, obviously, one has to, one has to see both. One has to see agitation from the outside, uh, uh, continual pressure uh, for much more fairness, uh, for, for full acceptance of disabled people within the society. But it's possible for somebody who, uh, who has a disability, especially a, quite a, uh, a visible disability, as with uh, our newly elected member in um, in Toronto, it's it's possible for that person to uh, to have a tremendous amount of leverage inside a caucus. Often, the leverage is not something that you can you can see publicly, uh, but political parties, uh, governments are very much shaped uh, by the people who can work powerfully from the inside, just as they are by the pressure from the outside. You know, Sue, in the last uh, election in the United States, a poll indicated that the disabled vote tipped the balance of power from Dukakis to Bush. And we'll take a look at that story next week. Bob McCormick has Tourette's syndrome. Recently, he was assaulted on a street in Toronto by a man who didn't understand his disability. Many people don't. It was only a few blocks from here that Bob McCormick had to be taken by ambulance to a nearby hospital after he was assaulted and injured on the street. What happened to you? I was walking a few blocks from here one night and somebody noticed that I was shouting and twitching, which are symptoms of the Tourette syndrome, and decided to have some fun with me. I didn't like it. I tried to kick them in the leg, I did, and we got into a rather nasty fight, as a result of which I was developing a bump on the back of my head, and my back has been a bit sore since that time. Did you, I mean, did anybody come to help you? Well, some of the older people in the area assisted me. The younger people sat around and did nothing. An estimated 10 to 15,000 Canadians have Tourette's syndrome. It's a hereditary disorder that causes a chemical imbalance in the brain, leading to increased motor activity. Tourette's syndrome is a disability that many people know nothing about. It varies in intensity and is characterized by a variety of symptoms. Tourette's syndrome is a condition in which the patient has multiple twitches, like body twitches, and makes sounds. In a minority of cases, they have a condition called coprolalia in which they swear. What are your symptoms? What happens to you? Are you going to swear at me? No, I don't think so. Um, I'm not uh, having symptoms of the condition in the coprolalia, in my case, if at all, is very rare. But uh, on a bad day, I'd be shouting and twitching and... Uh, Does stress or anxiety make it worse for you? Very much so, very much so. This must isolate you from society. Yes, it really does. Um, one thing I notice is when I'm in groups, I seem to want to be by myself. It's almost as if I've gotten used to being by myself. You know, as if I've, I've, I've made myself into a loner. I, I don't know exactly how that works out. Has this affected your relationships? Very much so, very much so. Okay. It's made it quite difficult. For, I mean, this problem really began about puberty. And puberty is always difficult, but when you've got the Tourette syndrome to go along with it, it's triply difficult. And uh, I had virtually no friends at all, but I found a young lady whom I was engaged to. We broke it off recently, it just didn't seem to work out, but she had a handicap. She had cerebral palsy, and we both understood one another. Are you disappointed in the way society treats you and others with Tourette syndrome? To a degree, but I think the real answer to that is the fact that Everybody's ignorant in something, and Tourette syndrome has not been that well known a condition, and the real answer is education. So rather than getting angry at people, my job is to help educate the public the way I hope I'm doing. How can you educate the public? Well, when I'm on the street car, I'll say, look, I have a condition called the Tourette syndrome, it's involuntary, I'm sorry, I cannot help it. 
sometimes people say, that's all right, we understand. Other times they won't understand. Well, in that case, you just ignore them. If you have to get off the TTC, okay, better than starting a fight, as I found out. What would you want to tell people? Just let people know that, look, I'm Bob McCormick. I have a condition called the Tourette syndrome. Nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect either. This is part of my imperfection. I'm a nice guy. Get to know me. You might even find me a good friend. If you're disabled and looking for work, you'll have to fill out job applications. What are your rights if a prospective employer asks you to identify yourself as disabled on that application? We put that question to Mel Graham in Winnipeg. He's with the Coalition of Provincial Organizations of the Handicapped, COPO. Well, you don't have to uh, answer a question on a app job application form that asks you if you have a disability. What you do have to do, though, is let your employer know about a disability that you might have that would relate to the performance of the job. So, for example, if you were applying to become a laborer, you might not need to tell an employer that your cerebral palsy uh, left you as well with, with a speech impediment. Uh, the only thing that your employer has to know about is the fact that you might have a, a bit of weakness on one side. That might have something to do with, with your lifting capabilities. As you know, Susan, there aren't many disabled people working in broadcasting yet, but there are a few of us. David Onley is another one. He's the host of a TV morning show in Toronto. Good morning, I'm David Onley in the City Pulse newsroom with the 830 News. And Dave, <laughs> take it away. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's like that? Okay, well, let's we'll okay, that for <laughs> These days, our society is more adaptive to change and that people who have disabilities are more accepted, not completely, but more than ever before. And so now is the time to go for it. And if, you know, you've been rejected in the past because of a disability, we're now entering an era where people may be getting positions because of their disability. Would you say that your disability of polio is an advantage or a disadvantage to your career? If anything else, it has uh, narrowed my focus on what I could do as opposed to uh, being uncertain as to maybe I should try this or maybe I should try that. I mean, I knew that I had a certain degree of mobility that I couldn't alter, that I had a certain degree of stamina that I really couldn't alter, and that I had a certain area of expertise. Uh, now that you can't alter. What's the secret of your success? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I don't know. Uh, it, um, I suppose a combination of things, uh, an enormously supportive family, um, enormously supportive wife, my own faith, uh, and the rest of it is a talent God gave me, you know, it's, and what you do with it afterwards, well, that sort of determines where you go. On a significantly lighter note this morning, you can determine what your talents are, um, to go Michigan. for it, for really minister, just go for it. More disabled people are getting out into the community, buying homes and renting apartments. Most kitchens in these places aren't designed for people who use wheelchairs. Even making a pot of tea can be difficult because cupboards are hard to breach and counters get in the way. Bruce Druitt, who's familiar with high-tech devices, showed me a solution to the problem. For a person who uses a wheelchair, such as myself, that we have a countertop that moves up and down on a bracket using a motor. That allows a person such as myself to get under a countertop and uh, to be able to reach cupboards at the same time according to the height that's needed. Uh, there's also a pressure sensitive uh, switch that doesn't allow the countertop to fall down on my arms or legs should there be an accident. What about the unit underneath? Well that's a set of drawers that really allows me to get under the countertop wherever I need to unobstructed. I just move the drawers out of the way wherever needed. Now that motorized system looks fairly expensive. Uh, what is the cost and are there any alternatives? Well actually the price range is around two or three thousand dollars depending on the kitchen space. The other option is to buy wall mounted brackets. You can set your counters at a height that suits you. It's not as flexible as the motorized system but it's cheaper and you can buy the brackets at most local hardware stores. Good. 
We'll be looking at more high-tech items in the weeks ahead. They've been chosen to give you an idea of what's available, but we haven't put them in through any exhaustive testing yet, so we can't give them our official endorsement. But if you'd like to know more about them, drop us a line and we'll pass your request along. Speaking of dropping us a line, here are a few of the letters we've received from viewers. This is from Sam McIntyre from Markham, Ontario. The Disability Network is meeting a very important need in our community. By giving information relative to disability issues to those of us who are disabled and also those not affected directly. I look forward to learning from your show. Everyone can benefit from your research. Thank you for presenting this informative program and we hope it will continue for many years to come. This letter is from Randy Ram. She's from Thorold, Ontario. Dear DNet, I'm a disabled adult and I've been in a wheelchair for approximately three years. I would like to say that I've only recently begun to watch your program and strongly feel that it is one of the best programs I've watched on TV. It is not only educational to the able-bodied viewing audience, but it is a great source of support and encouragement to those of us with disabilities. For myself, it reinforces my belief that disability is in essence only a state of mind. And though we may have physical barriers to contend with in our lives, given a little time and a lot of patience, anything is possible. Thanks a lot. Now this is a fax from Don Lazaro in Willowdale, Ontario. Having been recently diagnosed with MS and experiencing some difficulty in walking, I may be entering the world of the disabled. I certainly have a different outlook on things from previously being immune to the problems these people encounter. Your program has indeed come at a time when I and countless others need to know what this world is like. Your show is very insightful. Keep up the great informative perspectives you bring to the viewing public. Thanks, Don. You can write to us at the Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. That's the Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. And now, a final word from consumer activist Sandra Carpenter. It seems to be an unfortunate trait of human nature that we never stop to think about how much a person means to us until they are gone. I was reminded once again of that reality this summer. Marlene Gardner, president of the board of the Centre for Independent Living in Toronto, passed away suddenly in her sleep Monday, August 13th. Marlene was involved for many years with the Centre for Independent Living and in her role as president of that board, contributed to the existence of the Disability Network, as well as many other SILT initiatives. Marlene always gave generously of her time and efforts to SILT and many other committees. She was a quiet, hardworking woman who always shied away from the limelight. Because of that, she is one of the unsung heroines of the movement. She will be greatly missed. A great woman. We'll miss her. We most certainly will. And that's our show. But before we go, we would like to welcome all the new television stations that have decided to add the Disability Network to their fall schedules. And we'd like to also welcome brand new viewers. And if there are brand new viewers out there who would like to write to us to tell us what they'd like to see on the show this season, please do. Tune in next week to find out more about the recent breakthrough in cystic fibrosis research, what's new in technology, and we'll take a look at political muscle in the U.S. I'm Susan Pettit. And I'm Joe Coughlin. See you next time.